Welcome to Eclipse and Java Introducing Persistence. Now, most programs wouldn't be very useful if we couldn't save our work between sessions. Persistence is a term that covers the different methods of saving program data to disk files. In this tutorial, we're going to learn two of these methods, one using XML and the other using Java serialization. Now this tutorial assumes either that you have completed the Eclipse and Java for Total Beginners tutorial or that you have some familiarity with Eclipse and Java. We're going to use the My Library programs written in the Total Beginners tutorial for example. And the lessons are designed so that you can work side by side as we go along, pausing and rewinding as needed. Now before we get started, you should have Eclipse version 3.3 installed and you should have downloaded the file called persistencetutorial.zip and the tutorial companion PDF document from the website. The zip file contains an export of the project that will serve as our starting point for this tutorial. OK, let's get started. We've got Eclipse running and the first thing we'll do is create our project using the import wizard and the persistencetutorial.zip file we downloaded. Now it's easy to import and export Eclipse projects and this is a handy way to save projects and move them around. Now to create the project from the zip file, we just select File, Import, Existing Projects into Workspace, press Next, and we have two options. We can select either a root directory which we would use if we were importing a project from another directory on our network or we can choose select archive file and that's what we want here. So now we browse and we find the location of the zip file, select open and here it's going to list any projects that were exported into that zip file. In this case we just have one project, Persistent Tutorial so we press finish and now we've got the persistence tutorial project in our Eclipse workspace. Next, we're going to make sure our project classes run correctly by running our unit tests. If you completed the total beginner tutorial, you may remember that we developed unit tests that tested all of the classes in our my library project. As part of this, we wrote a test class called all tests that ran all of the tests at one time. So we'll open up the project in the Package Explorer. And remember, to get to the Package Explorer, we just go Window, Show View, Package Explorer. We'll open up the test folder. We've got to remember we've got separate folders for the source files and the test files. And we've got a class called All Tests. If we select that, select Run, Run As, JUnit Test, it's going to run through all of our tests and we get our nice green bar indicating that all the tests succeeded. At this point, we can be confident that we have the project set up correctly and that everything imported correctly. Next, Let's take a quick look at how the Persistence Tutorial zip file was created. To create a zip archive of one or more projects, we just go into File, Export, Archive File, select Next, and here we can select one or more projects to export. So we'll select both of these projects. We have options as to which folders we want to include and so on. And then give it the name of the archive file. Let's just call it test zip. Press finish and Eclipse has just exported both of our projects, Persistence Tutorial and Total Beginner, into that zip file. This is an easy way to share entire projects across different computers. It's also a useful way to take snapshots of a project. Now let's take a quick tour of our Persistence Tutorial project. If we expand, we see we've got an SRC directory and a test directory. The SRC directory holds our package, org persistence tutorial, and it has our three classes, book, my library, and person. We also have a test folder 
which we looked at before, which has a test class for each of our actual classes, plus this all tests class that allowed us to run all of the tests at once. We can also see our other project resources. In this case, we just have the Java runtime engine, and since we're using the JUnit unit test, we have the JUnit 3 library. At this point, we have a working version of our three classes. The person class represents people who can borrow our books. Book objects are, represent the books we own, and they contain a reference to a person object if a person is borrowing the book at that time. The My Library class contains a list of all the people who can borrow our books and a list of all of the books that we have that can be borrowed. Now we're ready to start working on persistence. Persistence just means a way for the program to remember the state of the objects when the computer is turned off or the program is halted. There are a number of ways in Java to do this. We'll use two of these, saving in XML format and saving using Java serialization. Other common ways to save data include using a text file or using a SQL database. Persistence normally involves writing and reading files from the computer or network disk system. When we use resources that fall outside the control of our program, we cannot be certain whether or not an operation will succeed. For example, we can test our program saving to our local disk drive, but a user might try to save to a non-existent drive or to a directory where the user is not allowed to write. In these situations, we want to practice what we call defensive programming. In other words, we write the code knowing that certain operations are risky and that they might fail. And we try to make sure that any failures don't cause the program to crash or lose data. In Java, we do this using what are called try-catch blocks. Let's try out a try-catch block using the Eclipse scrapbook. The Eclipse scrapbook is a great way to experiment with Java code. We'll create a new scrapbook page in our project using File, New, Other, and under down here under Java Run Debug is Scrapbook Page. We'll press Next. We'll put it in the Persistence Tutorial Project, and we'll just call it My Scrapbook, and press Finish. And now we have a scrapbook page where we can play with different Java statements. Now the way we use the scrapbook is to type in some code, select it with the mouse, and then press one of the three execute buttons, inspect, display, or execute. So let's try it with some code. We'll type long x equals 1 divided by 0, which we no is an illegal command. You can't, you're not allowed to divide by zero. So this, this will give us a runtime error. And then let's do system out print line. This won't print. Now we'll select this with the mouse and we'll press the execute selected text. See what happens. Okay, so we get an exception occurred during evaluation, arithmetic exception, which is what we would expect. We get a message down here in the console, can't divide by zero. And very important, our second line, the system out print line, this won't print, did not execute. We didn't get that down here in the console. So the program halted right here on the line where we encountered the arithmetic error. Now let's see what happens when we use a try catch block. First we'll declare our variable and set it to 1 just so we'll be able to make sure we knew what happened. Then we're going to put the illegal divide statement inside a try block. Now we're going to say catch and in parentheses we say arithmetic exception. We say the type of exception we want to catch and inside the catch block we'll set x equal to 0 and then we'll print out a message so we know that the catch block 
executed, can't divide by zero. And then outside the catch block, we'll print out another message so we know that the program continued to run. So we'll say this will print, and then we'll see what the value of x is. We're going to clear out the console so we can see what's going on. We'll highlight, press execute, and we can see that the program didn't halt. The catch block executed, so we got this message. We didn't get the exception message in the console. X was set to zero. And importantly, this last line was executed. So the program, again, didn't halt or didn't crash. Now note that the catch statement has this arithmetic exception E in parentheses after it. This tells the compiler that we were only catching this one type of exception. If any other type of exception were to occur in the try block, we would get a runtime error and the program would halt. If we wanted, we could just use the keyword exception instead of arithmetic exception, and then that would catch any type of exception. Another option in try catch blocks is to have multiple catch statements with different exceptions so that you can do different kinds of processing depending on which type of exception you get. So to sum up, if an exception occurs inside a try block and the exception is caught by the catch statement, then control is turned over to the catch block and the program doesn't halt or crash. Now an exception in Java is an object just like any other object and it has methods. One common exception method is the print stack trace method which prints out useful details to the console about the exception so that you can get an idea of where in the program the exception was triggered and what type it is. Let's try it as follows. We'll also add a finally block. So we'll replace this line with e dot print stack trace, which again is a method of exceptions. Then we're going to put this system out println inside a finally block, and then we're going to add one more line, another system out println, so we can see that the program continues to execute after the try catch. We'll clear that out. We'll highlight. We'll press the execute again, and here the print stack trace printed the same type of information we saw earlier when the program crashed. However, it's important to understand that the program continued to execute and didn't crash. So we got the finally block. This will print an x equals zero, and then we got the program continuing out of the finally block saying life goes on. Now the finally block is an optional block you can put after a try catch and the great thing about a finally block is that it always executes regardless of whether or not there was an error. This is useful when you want to make sure something is done whether there was an error or not. We'll use this for closing files. When we close files, we want to make sure that they always get closed whether we got an error or not. Now in a real life program, we wouldn't use a try catch block for something that we can control like divide by zero. We would just use some other way of making sure we never allowed a divide by zero. But we will need to use try catch blocks when doing disk file input and output. In the next lesson, we're going to update our test environment to use the newer JUnit 4 test programs. Then we'll start working on reading and writing disk files using the test first approach. This is the end of lesson one. I'm Mark Dexter saying so long for now.